My name is Lyndon Bower and I'm the third speaker for, for this evening. And uh, as uh, David and, and wanted tough text to follow, so uh, I'll do my best. But I think we can start immediately with uh, you know, any reflection of the 1990s must of course be preceded by, by a short discussion of the 1980s and what we in fact started with, uh, with that already. Um, I come from a slightly different background to both Watu and, and, and David because uh, I was born in the Eastern Cape and uh, I attended school at Besselsdorf Senior Secondary and, and that's a very significant part of South African history as, as I will illustrate as the evening goes on. And one of the first things to, to, that I experienced was that my, I was introduced to chess probably in about 1983, about 10 years old, but didn't really play. And then in 1986, I started to play uh, more vigorously when I got to high school because I didn't play chess at all at primary school. And I recall playing my first recorded game in 1987, and I was using the older Mister recording book. The brown ones, and I actually still have that recording book at home. And I played against uh, one of my my teammates uh, from school at, at that time. But what was interesting is that, of course, uh, we heard about the South African Chess Federation experience, uh, which was what David and Walter spoke about. And at the same time, sure, thank you. We also had a, a Black South African uh, Chess Association, and this association at that time was called the South African Chess Association, SACA. And this was 1986, and South Africa was burning, state of emergencies all over the place. But what was very interesting for all of us, uh, and especially with me learning chess in 1987, is that one thing was clear in South African chess, is that if you wanted to be a good player, a better player, you had to beat the players from Cape Town. That was one of those facts that we sort of knew that all the top players in the country was living in Cape Town. And uh, at that stage, uh, what do we, we didn't yet know about you, but uh, I'm sure we'll, as it, uh, okay, this thing is just jumping a bit here, so let me just get my, my page quickly. Okay, so there we go. So I think the first thing is that, uh, so I started to play in 1987 and um, made one remarkable thing was uh, I made the EP senior team before I even made the junior team. And I in fact made the EPB team. <laughs> and uh, in that particular team uh, was people like uh, Yanni Safir, uh, Dr. Cornelius Thomas, who was from Cales River originally, and then moved to, to Port Elizabeth. And um, I remember very clearly that uh, we were preparing to go play in the Easter tournament in East London. And this tournament would be held in Buffalo Flats. Uh, all day and um, since I had made the team I was now invited to team meetings and what was very interesting for me uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen is that we spent the whole month of March preparing to play against a certain gentleman called Shabir Bawadin. He was known as the menace of the circuit at that stage and was a winner in, in many events and uh, we spent Sunday afternoons trying to figure out which defense we were going to play against Shabir Bowden. Of course, I didn't know Shabir at all, and it was Yanni Safir and uh, Samuel Gertz and others that used to tell me, you can't play the Dutch against Shabir, you can't do this. So, you know, they had their own thing. I had my own tournament. I was just going to, I was just going to go play. And uh, so what was interesting is that uh, we then got to East London, my first tournament, held over the Easter weekend. And in my very first round, I played a guy called Andrew Martin. And Andrew Martin was from Steinitz Chess Club. And of course, I, he made his first move E4, and I played C5, and he didn't play D4. And I thought, hmm, it's quite clear to me that this guy is going to lose very quickly because he should have known he must first play knight F3. I mean, that's standard. I then took the pawn, and his next move was C3. He's giving me another pawn. And of course, I didn't know this, and I took the pawn. On move 23, I resigned. Because, of course, Andrew Martin was a club player, established club player in Cape Town and played for Steinitz, and he just simply demolished me uh, from the board. So there I was, made my debut, SA Open, EBB team, and I lose round one. And as it goes, that's how these tournaments start. And uh, in two rounds later, I, I beat Ashley Schuller, who some of you would know. And uh, I go on to beat some of the other players and along the way. And then I lose to uh, a gentleman called Rodney Williams, who later starts the Capablanca Chess Club, and who later I, I began to know as a, a policeman and also a player that uh, won the 2001 Western Province Open. 
But it was very really interesting that we, we all traveled to East London and one of the, the stories from the East London tournament is that the Cape Town players in fact came down in a truck because that was how we used to travel in those days. You used to be four to five, six people in a car and you used to come down and in the 87 tournament, the Cape Town players came down uh, in a truck to East London. And that was uh, part of the nice things because we of course got to know each other and, and at that stage that was my first tournament and I was making my first acquaintance and I was playing very much at the back of the hall as, as it were, watching the Shabirs and Maxwells battling it out on the, on the top boards uh, on the stage in Buffalo Flats. But as we continued along and uh, I played at, uh, now we're concentrating on the school level things, we, we of course realized that there were other chess going on because all of a sudden on a Sunday morning, Grandmaster Quanteros is playing a Mr. Charles de Villiers on TV in 1987 and of course we all switched in because at that stage that was the only chess that, that, that we knew and here was Charles playing against uh, Grandmaster Miguel Quanteros. I didn't really understand the move so much but it was exciting just to at least see chess on television in, in 1987. And over the next three to four years those Easter tournaments became very important to, to us in the in the black chess world as we, we called ourselves and styled ourselves. In 1988, we traveled to Mitchell's Plain to play the, the CAPSA Open, because by now it's called the CAPSA Open, Chess Association for the People of South Africa. And uh, we played in West, in, uh, in Mitchell's Plain in Westridge. And uh, Dion Solomons won that particular tournament in 1988. And uh, Watu, just like you, we also had a guy like Mr. Pato. His name was Kasi Olifant. And what Kasi, he lives in Free State today, is that when Kasi had a check, he would loudly proclaim, check. And you'd go over to see what was happening and you'd realize he's a piece down. <laughs> but he, he called attention to his game nonetheless. And uh, I remember playing in, in 1988 uh, in that tournament and uh, one of the, the interesting things for me was round one, who should I be meeting? Andrew Martin. And here we're playing round one, essay open, and I play Andrew Martin, but this time I've picked up my own rating strength and my own understanding, and I beat him in a, in a well-played game, which I'm very pleased about. And then uh, I then met a certain player called Roland Willenberg, and I uh, was in exchange up early against him, and I thought I was winning easily, but I wasn't, and we drew the game. And that was the first time I actually made the acquaintance of of the Wallenberg family as it were in 1988 at, at that particular event. And I still have some of the photos uh, of, of Dion and others um, playing in that event because it was a very nice event. Everybody looked forward to the, to the Easter event. And in 1989, we traveled through to Durban because uh, I'm trying to illustrate to you that, that chess was played in all parts of the country within the black chess communities and in the Natal Chess Association organized the 1989 tournament at the place called ML Sultan Technicon. And we, we played at the Technicon and uh, what was interesting is that Western Province, because of the distance between Cape Town and, and Durban, arrived one round late. So uh, very interesting, Dion and others, Maxwell Solomon was also there, now is one round behind the tournament and they enter round two. And they've got to play catch up. I unfortunately was paired against Sean Willenberg in round one and I then lost to him in round one in Durban and that uh, put paid to my chance of winning the SA Championship because my fellow colleagues Alistair Chapman and Rashad Ward then ended up playing in the finals against one another because they then went, went through and Rashad Ward uh, from, from Eastern Province who was at that stage in matric won the CAPSA Open in, in 1989. Um, that was probably my breakthrough year also because in that tournament I beat Maxwell for the first time. And uh, in, in a Karo Khan, in fact, and um, Maxwell and I still reminisce about that game because uh, he was sure he was better, but I, I, I think the point was on the board for me, but that was my, my breakthrough year as, as well. And then in, in 1990, um, the tournament was then in Port Elizabeth, the, the Easter Open, but this time, because of various reasons, it was not held over Easter, but actually moved to December. And Malcolm Fredericks from Bella Knights beat me in the final round to become the Capsa Open champion in 1990. 
Dion had blundered in the previous round against a player called Basil Barnes by simply playing queen a5 and Basil then played knight takes queen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there was, was Dion's tournament. So it was very interesting then, then purely fortuitously because I probably wasn't strong enough yet at that time. But there it was, I'm playing final round board one against Malcolm Fredericks and, and I think uh, Malcolm was probably objectively stronger than me at, uh, in that particular tournament. And, uh, at that stage as well, and Malcolm then uh, won the tournament. So I'm not sure, um, David, if it was Malcolm or Latigan uh, <laughs> who won the tournament, but uh, nonetheless, Malcolm Fredericks won that particular tournament. <laughs> and, and and I think the, the Easter tournament is something that we, we should seriously consider having, uh, you know, make a comeback because the Easter tournaments, uh, Steinitz is having one now uh, next month, but we haven't had Easter tournaments for quite a long time in South Africa and people actually enjoyed traveling to them as well. I want to, to, to take your mind a bit back to the schools because both David and Watu mentioned the schools, uh, 1981, the various championships that uh, David illustrated and Watu. And what was interesting for me at that particular stage is that the first South African schools championship for, for black and colored schools at the time actually took place in 1982. And in 1982, the tournament was won by Sean Willenberg and Nazim Sami. Now Nazim Sami was from Port Elizabeth and uh, was probably one of our strongest players in, that came from PE. And Sean Willenberg and, and Nazim shared the title in that particular year. In, now, we only had the school championship every two years. So in 1984, Dion Solomons won that particular event, the school championship. And in 1986, Nazim Mustafa won the tournament. And in 1988, Winston Dalpat, the current vice president of Chesa, he won the event in, in Johannesburg. I then won the event in 1989 and 1990. And then Two other teammates of mine from Bethelsdorf Senior Secondary won in 1991, Shane Bassett and Lionel Galant. So we had an extraordinary situation in South African chess that one school, Bethelsdorf Senior Secondary, held the individual school's title for five years in a row, from 88 right through to, to 1992. And Duke Simons, who's in the audience today, he in fact played in the 1992 school's championship as, as well with, uh, alongside Lionel and, and others. And um, Bethelsdorf for a long time provided all the players to the Eastern Province teams. And um, we, we started in 1988, um, and Roland Willenberg later commented on this, that 1988 was the first time that the Western Province actually lost the school's championship that they had won for so many years because Eastern Province then uh, dethroned him in, in Johannesburg um, at the school called CJB uh, on that side. And in 1989, we continued uh, with this. It's uh, very interesting that um, a number of the players are still playing today that in fact competed in, in those years. Uh, the players like Adip Abrams and, and others all, con all continue to play to this day. So that's the, the uh, on the board you'll just see there, the 82, 82 84, 86, uh, 88, 86 a tournament was held in Outswaring, uh, 88 Johannesburg, 89 tournament was held at Klein Niederberg in, in Paul, and 1990 the tournament was held at St. Thomas High School in, in Port Elizabeth, and 1991 the tournament was held in Cape Town, and Lionel Galant, I'm not sure where the 92 tournament was, so in Durban. So you had uh, a, a number of, I would say, Eastern Province then also making a breakthrough in chess by actually now starting to play very strongly. And I want to tell, uh, tell the audience about a very interesting story that I only heard about 15 years later. Ewan Cromout, who had heard about our school, Bethelsdorf Senior Secondary, contacted our teacher, Mr. John Ritchie, and I'll show you his photo in a moment, and asked if his school, Andrew Rabi, who was a very strong chess school, could play against Bethelsdorf Senior Secondary in a match. And Mr. John Ritchie said, sorry, Mr. Cromout, but we cannot entertain your request because no normal sport can be played in an abnormal society. And, and Ewan was taken aback by this because uh, in that picture, you'll see is Mr. John Ritchie is a white gentleman who was our teacher. <laughs> and here he was espousing the values of SACOS at the time. And when he took the phone call from Ewan uh, Kromot in 1989, 
he was called to the office because at that stage there was no cell phones, as you all know. And our school principal, Mr. Raymond Urin, was the president of the South African Senior School Sports Association, told uh, Mr. Ritchie, here's a gentleman from Andrew Rabi on the phone that down to play a chess match against you. And without you know, any further ado, Mr. Ritchie just refused the match. And Mr. Ritchie never told us that. As schoolboys, I mean, we all knew a little about politics at the time, but Ewan told me the story in 2002 that uh, he couldn't believe when Mr. Ritchie just refused the match, but that was the nature of, of Mr. Ritchie. And uh, at the back there, you'll see uh, uh, Shane Bassett, uh, Mr. Ritchie himself, Fazlo Abdullah, Valman de Brain, uh, Conrad Blichenow, uh, you'll see in the, in the photos when it comes out on the website, is I'm sitting in the middle, and then Winston Dalpat is sitting next to me with the big ears on, on that side. <laughs> But Conrad Blichnout later on became the best matriculant in the country the following year, and that was something very, uh, very nice for us because, of course, Conrad, best matriculant, he scored something like 100% in maths and physics and science, and that was followed up about three years later by another chess player called Earl King, who also scored 100% in maths and science, also from Bethelstorff. And this was our, our team. And the interesting thing about the 1918, uh, about our, our team in 1989 was that we all made EP schools, but the South African champion of Shard Ward never got his EP colors that year because the team, the schoolboy team, was too strong. So Rashad had this unfortunate reputation of in the year that he won the SA championship, he never made the schools team. But he, he won the SA championship, and, and well done to him as well. We, we then, uh, as, a, as a school, we continued. But what was interesting that I want to also, and some of you may know Port Elizabeth, I know Shabir uh, won the EP championship a number of times. What was interesting for me when I did my research was that Winston, Shane, uh, and Lionel all came from an area called Salt Lake in Port Elizabeth, which is a very tough area. Uh, Salt Lake is, is an underprivileged community and it's uh, nowadays rife with gangsterism. But in that area of Salt Lake came the South African schools champions that, that could play well and could beat anybody uh, in, in South Africa. And that's something that uh, Salt Lake would, would have been akin to a sort of a Manenberg type situation. But we were very glad that they were able to come out of those types of situations. I. We now turn our attention to, to university and, and, and to Cape Town in 1991 because this is when I make my real acquaintance in Cape Town. And, and I arrive in Cape Town in 1991, uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and uh, I arrive in, in January. And pretty much in the first month, the first week of February, the uh, SA close was being held. The CAPSA close, as it were, was being held uh, at, at Pentec, as it was called at that stage. Now, in 1989, there was a school, a university body called Satisco, the South African Tertiary Institution Sports Council, and they had played in Sonia, at Sonia College in Worcester, the South African um, chess championships together with others, and that tournament was won by a player that now, that lives in Elsie's River and still plays for Elsie's River called David Hartzenberg. Some of you may have seen David, he's, he still plays, he's around. And David, in fact, won that tournament, and uh, with him in that team was players like Virgil Fritz, Edwin November, um, and even the self-same Andrew Martin, that, whom I had lost and beaten uh, a year or two before. So when I got to university in 1991, I was actually aghast to find that the chess club had ceased to exist. For some reason, in 1990, there was no chess. And of course, that just couldn't be because I'm the SA schools champion at the time and I need to, to have some chess. And um, I then soon went about um, with the assistance of Bertie van Wyk, making a few posters and putting it up around the, the, the university. And we then started again. Now, I just want to take a moment to just talk to you about Bertie because in a sense, uh, 1991, Bertie was the mover and shaker of South African chess in 1991. Uh, a lot of people uh, have their own views on what happened in 1991, but I'll give my own view, so that's fine, because uh, I'm sure Omar and others may, may have their own views of what happened. But what was interesting was that uh, Bertie van Wyk was a committed ANC member, and at that time there were negotiations about negotiations, talks about talks. People will remember the Khrushchev a minute between the ANC and the National Party. And what Nelson Mandela had called for was to have 
was to start the talks with the establishment bodies of sport. And this created quite a debate within black sport in general, because many people were of the view that you cannot speak to the establishment white sport bodies until we have the vote. And that was the view, a very strong view, in many, many communities. The ANC, however, differed with, with that view, and, and, and Bertie had followed this mantra and then initiated the discussions, in fact, with the white chess authorities at the time. So we had a very interesting situation that uh, Bertie heeded the call. This is February 1991. I had just ended second in the SA closed. Dion Solomons uh, retained his title and uh, won that particular event. And uh, Gordon Lawrence and I ended joint second in that particular event in 1991. But in the background, uh, Bertie was talking. I wasn't part initially of the February, March discussions because I was still at university starting out, so Bertie had the discussions. But what was interesting, and, and I just uh, wanted to pause here for a moment uh, to tell Aldo that uh, I lost to Gordon Lawrence and I waited 25 years to take my revenge because Gordon again never faced me in a tournament for some reason. We always missed each other. And 25 years later, in the same opening, the Kings Indian Defense, I beat him in a league match between Bella Knights and Steiner. So thank you for putting that Matt, uh, Mr. Lawrence, up against me. But we, I recall uh, in 1991 meeting with a, a number of the, the senior players um, of the establishment body at the time and even traveling to Tokai where Nick was, was staying at the time, uh, going with Bertie, of course, this was all very bewildering to me because uh, it's a new world and uh, here we are having discussions um, in the middle of the night, as it were, having talks, uh, etc. And then things came to a head in April 1991, because in April 1991, Mr. Van Rienen had organized the Western Province League, and the first round was going to take place at Modedam High School um, in Bontiel. And UWC and Belleville South and all the other chess clubs, Grassy Park, Steinitz, Manianani, they all gathered to play, and as it were, it's on the Saturday afternoon, so that's where you go play. And I can't even recall who the first match was against, but what was more significant was that Mr. Andre van Rienen then publicly chastised Mr. Bertie van Wyk and expelled Belleville South Chess Club and UWC Chess Club from participating further in the league. So there we were, one game in the league, and we were then expelled by Mr. Van Rienen for talking to the establishment white chess federation at that particular time. So that was quite a blow to me because, of course, as a player, I had just come second to Dion in the SA close. I had just arrived in Cape Town, the mecca of chess, uh, uh, as, as we had seen it. And yeah, I was expelled by Mr. Van Rienen, my, my own body at the, at the time. But then things took some twists and turns because I then discovered, which I didn't know before, that Professor Nick Pretorius was also a lecturer at UWC. He was actually in the B block that I walked through every day, and every day the law faculty was situated in the B block. He had a little office in a department called Hellenistic Greek. And that was where he was, and I never knew that. And he was, he always came uh, to university with his little French beret, as it were. And there's Mr. Pretorius, uh, Professor Pretorius, with his check jacket, not sure if it's standard issue for professors, but that's, that's what he wore with his beret. And, uh, and we met him at, at university because he came to one or two of the tournaments where, where we were playing because by that time he had made contact with, with Bertie because of course Bertie was at University of the Western Cape at the same time. So our expulsion, however, caused an impetus in the discussions of unity because what then took place was that in June of that year, Bertie van Wyk convened a meeting at Belleville South Library at which all the major establishment figures of chess in Cape Town were invited and people came. And we went to Belleville South Library in Castleslaugh Road where we sat and we had discussions. Of course, I didn't really participate in the discussions because I was too young and uh, I was there to, to listen and carry the tray as it were, make the coffee, all of those sort of things because I was 18 years old. 
So for me, Bertie took me along, and I didn't realize at the time he was actually mentoring me. So, so as it were, I would just sit and take notes and listen and, and, and go with. But what was interesting is that our expulsion caused us now to propel the unity discussions. And one of the, the fondest memories um, that, that I have was that, in fact, Bertie asked Virgil Fritz and myself to spearhead development of chess. So every afternoon, Virgil Fritz, who was a third year BSc student at the time, he and I used to drive to various areas around Cape Town and do chess development. So we resuscitated Elsie's River Chess Club. We went to Alt Road every Wednesday. We went to Kales River to Highbury. We went to, um, to Cryfontein where we met uh, people in the library. And one of my best uh, developments that I consider was also coaching at the Athlone School for the Blind. And it was actually at the Athlone School for the Blind that I met Melvin Lucas who was at that stage a student there, and Melvin later on went on to win um, a silver medal at the, the Braille Olympiad years later, in about 2002, 2003, when they had. But in that time, we spearheaded the development. At the same time, while Virgil and I were driving around every afternoon doing development, we also had Bertie making phone calls and overtures to other people in other provinces, because by now, there was a very tense battle between SACOS and the National Sport Congress. And this battle was raging in all sporting codes in South Africa. It was not only in chess, because the question was, should you be speaking to your opposition while you don't have the vote? And it was a, it was a crisp question. Families were split. People were asking those questions. There was no easy answers. And when I went back to Port Elizabeth during the vacation in 1991, my old high school principal, who I admired greatly, didn't want to speak a word to me because I had sold him out. Because I was their champion, the school's champion, and here I was already where they heard talking to the opposition, as it were. So a very difficult time because I'm not really playing chess now because we, we're busy with development work. But one of the outcomes of the June meeting was very interesting was that it was agreed that there would be a friendly match. And the friendly match would be between Cape Town Chess Club, whom we are honoring for the 132 years of existence, and a match against Belleville South UWC team. And that was a very significant day. So around about the end of August 1991, we again gathered at Belleville South Library now to play the very first South African friendly match between an establishment affiliated club, and of course the former affiliated club, Belleville South and UWC, against Cape Town, uh, as we were not affiliated to CAPSA any longer because we had been banned. But let's look at the, the results of that particular day because it makes a very interesting reading. Many of the names here would be new to you, uh, and some haven't been revealed for, the, for a long time. On board one, Charles de Villiers lost to Lyndon Bower. On board two, Howard Goldberg beat Virgil Fritz. On board three, Nick Barnett beat Edwin November. Andrew Mendelssohn beat Samuel Leanditz. The late Franz Vergeers beat Gavin Blau. Nathan Geffen beat Gabriel Kampfer. Penny Levine in the audience tonight beating Bertie van Wyk. Graham West beating Russian Keane. Conrad van Sale Smith, a uh, junior at the time, drew with Frankie Stevens. Ulrich Possenberg beat Christo Loff. Jerome Pochenpool beat Salvin Watkins. Dr. Eustace Moses lost to Salim Daud, and then Louis van Seyl uh, beat F. Adams from, uh, I think, Belleville South. So, so the, the final score was Cape Town 10.5, Belleville South UWC combination 2.5. But the main story that the newspapers all carried the next day was the South African champion suffers shock defeat against unknown. And uh, one of the interesting things was that when the newspapers actually came to interview me, uh, I said to them, actually, I'm sorry, I'm not the best player. <laughs> These other guys that I mentioned, uh, Dion, Shabir, Maxwell, and said that I was just uh, fortunate, but I had won, but uh, there are other better players than, than what I was at the time. So that was the focus. And in fact, Duke and I were even debating what was the score of the match, uh, because both he and I had thought the score was 11-1, but it was never 11-1. It actually, we had Salim, uh, uh, who 
who plays for Omar's club when he's in the country uh, as well. So, I'm not sure was the chairman of, at, was it Elan in 91 also? Yeah. yeah, could probably be Elan as, as well. So, and in, since I was from Port Elizabeth, Bertie asked me to play, organize a similar match in PE. So there I went off in November, in the holidays, university had now finished, and now we organized the match against PE Chess Club, who, who was also one of the oldest chess clubs in the country. And Ewan Kromot and, and others were very glad to organize and, and play, and my club was known as Alakine Chess Club, and we played, but this time, Alakine Chess Club handsomely beat PE Chess Club. This caused consternation in the PE papers and among the members of, of PE Chess Club because they did not realize that chess was also very strong in the northern areas of, of Port Elizabeth. So I, I was very privileged to have played in the first two unity matches ever uh, in this country between two of the oldest chess clubs, Cape Town and PE, and then of course the Belleville South and the Alakine Chess Club. And then of course we, we need to talk about the unity tournament because by now, we November, late November 91, and we had agreed as an outcome of the summit in June that there would be a unity tournament in Cape Town. And this tournament also caused a lot of division because the question was, are you going to participate in the tournament or not? Because at that stage it still wasn't clear the division between SACOS, no normal sport and abnormal society, and the call by the ANC and the National Sport Congress to actually have establishment talks. And many players made different choices. Uh, Roland Willenberg, when I spoke to him on Sunday, told me Steinitz as a club decided not to participate in that event. Omar and others also decided not to participate in that event. So many people made their own decisions. I, of course, because I was a strong proponent of unity, we organized uh, players from Eastern Province, from Free State, and everybody to come play that unity tournament that was held in Bishops. And Duke participated in that tournament as well. Dion participated in that tournament, David. And what was very interesting was that tough games were played. That was where the first real tournament, and I mean, it, it was Pika Larkas, Jonathan Gluckman, everybody uh, played in that tournament because it was also very historic. And uh, that's a picture that uh, was taken of the joint winners of, of that particular event. There you have Jonathan and, uh, and Dion and, and David, very, very strong uh, at, that, at that particular time. And the picture that was featured in Mark Levitt's magazine was in fact uh, Dion versus David and Lyndon versus Jonathan. And I think that was either the second last round or the last round, but that was the, the picture that they decided to use at the end uh, to describe the Unity Congress. So a lot of division still because a lot of the strong Cape Town players did not participate in the Unity Tournament, um, but it was called the Unity Tournament and, and uh, I still remember that the advertisement showed a tiger and had the rounds on and, and we played at Bishops. So that was our first Unity uh, uh, Tournament that, that we had and there we have our, our winners. So I think that's a recent photo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. I want to, to talk a bit about the, the university chess because this was also something that was uh, coming along very strongly in South Africa at the time and in 1991 we had the organization called the South African Tertiary Institution Sport Union, SATISU. Now remember, 89 it was called SATISCO and now we had SATISU. And SATISU was established and uh, because we we were banned from club chess at the time. Uh, Bertie took a strong interest in making sure that we had university chess. And um, our very first tournament that uh, I played at university level was in a place called Sosanguve Kharankua. And we traveled by bus, I don't know, probably nearly a, a day and a, and a bit to get to Sosanguve. Uh, and we played at the medical campus of, of Madunsa. And uh, we participated there, and it was great because you had other universities that also came to, to participate. And uh, from there onwards, chess became established as part of the indoor games of Satisu. So whenever the darts, badminton, volleyball, code called tenniquit, darts, table tennis, chess went along uh, with them as well. And um, the, from 1991 to 1995, UWC dominated the university sector, winning all the team championships. And out of the four 
uh, I competed in four out of the five championships. I won that with uh, Matthew Churgish of Wits uh, winning in 1994 when I played in, in Moscow uh, alongside Dion and, and others. That's a, a photo of us there in Medunsa, and one can see there I'm, I still had an afro, no gray at the time. And uh, there was Frankie Stevens, Gabriel Kempfer, Valman De Brain, and Samuel Lienditz, all players who actually participated in that first uh, uni that first match against Cape Town Chess Club were continuing at the university level as well. One of my personal highlights was in 1992 becoming the University of the Western Cape Sportsperson of the of the year, uh, and that was against tough competition because the the Olympic athlete Bobang Piri, 400 meters, he was also one of the stars of, of UWC at the time, but the university had elected to, to make me a sports person of the year. Interestingly enough, uh, Kenny Willenberg and Shane Willenberg has gone on to win the individual um, University of the Western Cape sports person of the year. So I'm not sure, uh, David Dion, how many other universities has actually honored chess by having three chess players being made uh, sportspersons of the of the year as well. This is uh, an interesting photo because you may recognize some people in this photo. It's a 1995 UWC chess team, and you've got Brandon Losper, uh, Duke Simon, who's sitting there uh, next to Dr. Iso, Calvin van Breda, and you even have a young Mr. Aldo Smart, <laughs> looking very dapper and smart there in his uh, outfit. And that was the 1995 uh, UWC uh, chess team that uh, competed and and nowadays of course if you win at university level you can go compete in many of the events overseas at, at that stage we didn't have that opportunity because of finance and other reasons but nowadays that those opportunities exist in those days it was there was no flights for us when you played in inside the country you traveled by bus to Durban 22 hours later and that's how uh, that's how it looked typically on, on a bus that's our team in 1993. You'll see the, the tops, that's uh, Satisu. And that's the, the tops that we played, and that's a chess team. Then and, and we continue to play, yeah, 1993, Western Province team. And then, of course, one of the, the big highlights for me was uh, the visit of Anatoly Karpov to the University of the Western Cape. And um, this had a very strange start, because uh, just one day out of the blue, Bertie told me, you must be ready. Grandmaster Karpov is coming to visit UWC. and." Uh, and he said, but you never told me this before. And he said, well, he didn't know either because Professor Andre Odendal, who later became the CEO of Western Province Cricket, was the, in charge of the history department. And as a uh, guy in the history department, he decided to invite Karpov as a guest because Karpov was a member of the Russian Duma at the time and uh, president of the World Peace Foundation. Eh? And Karpov accepted the invitation. So there it was, 1993, and uh, Karpov coming to visit UWC. And so we had at this time the strongest chess player uh, uh, at that time to, to visit the university. And of course, all of us came. If you look closely at that photo, I know it's not so great. You'll see there's Lyndon with an I love chess Garfield t-shirt. Yes, that's me. And then you have Dion Pick and then you have Jonathan Gluckman <laughs> also in, in that photo standing to sort of next to me as, as well. And uh, that was Karpov and, and he came to visit us in 93. And uh, my relationship with Karpov continued because in Moscow, 94, uh, I bumped into him at the, at the hotel, at the Cosmos Hotel, and we chatted again uh, there. And in 1995, still the year, uh, Ruben, before emails, uh, Karpov sent a fax to UWC, inviting me to come study at the Karpov School of Chess in Sweden for a few months in 1996, and uh, I, I accepted his invitation and actually went to Sweden uh, and stayed. Lyndon, just to tell you a little funny story on that in Jovo, because I was in Jovo at the time, and more mm -hmm. people you were there, maybe watching, we had one of the strangest gatherings ever, because they had two world champions yeah. together. They had Kenny Pizia <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Karpov, and had a function together. So we had the boxing world and the chess yeah. world together in a function. <laughs> 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 Unbelievable. So, so there was Karpov, and uh, we were very glad to have made his acquaintance. Um, on the, the chess scene in Cape Town, the, the club scene was a very vibrant one because in 1992, the first unified league started in Cape Town. Now, there were still clubs, 92, there were still clubs outside of the unified fold. So, there were clubs, Bella Knights, uh, a chess club had, had decided not to participate in the league, and a number of other clubs had also not decided, but there were many 
former CAPSA clubs who decided to participate in the league and uh, the University of Cape Town won the first ever unified league in 1992. So well done to, to UCT in that one. And then in nine. Yes, that's 96. Yes, yes. But that's another story for another day. So, so however, in 1993, the, the, we had a, a great impetus when Steinitz, Dion uh, Solomons joined Steinitz on board one, and uh, Steinitz then won the league for the first time in 1993 as well. And um, I actually uh, found later on a, a press cutting where the Steinitz was actually featured in a newspaper called The South, which was still uh, active at, at this time as well. So one of the, the, the interesting stories at the time was that um, I was playing for UWC, Duke and Elder was also, and we played against False Bay. And I didn't play in that particular match because I had, I had a test the next day. So Aldo and Duke and Eugene Kluter, who stays in America now, they took my car and they traveled to False Bay to play against False Bay, who was, lead, who was being led by Dieter Marshall and others. And then they came back to university and told me that UWC had beaten False Bay 4-1. And uh, I was captain of the team and uh, it was my duty to phone Roland because no emails, no cell phones. So of course I then, from, my, from the ticky box at UWC, I dialed Roland's number and Roland said, wait, are you sure about that result? Because False Bay was one of the top teams and in fact, uh, we, UWC had caused the upset by beating False Bay 4-1. And uh, so nowadays when, uh, Youngsters think that it was just so easy to go on chess results to see the there we had to phone and Roland then whoever answers the phone whether it's Roland's wife or Kenny or Craig who was 10 or 11 at the time they would just write down the result and on the, on the Thursday evening Roland would, would fax it to Nick Barnett who would, who would then put it in the August uh, so that's how we used to, to run the league back in the day as well. But I think one of the undoubted highlights uh, for me in the early 1990s was the readmission of South Africa uh, to FIDE. Now, this happened on the 22nd of June 1992, and was one of the last, uh, in fact, motions that the FIDE Congress passed. And what many people don't realize is that South Africa is actually in a very illustrious company, because in 1992, the entire ex-Soviet Union got readmitted to FIDE. So when you read the minutes of that FIDE meeting, you'll see there that it is proposed that the following countries be readmitted to FIDE, and then they start Azerbaijan, Belarus, and they continue with all the ex-Soviet states, and then South Africa as well. So we all got readmitted back into, into FIDE in June uh, 1992. But preceding that was that in February 1992, FIDE sent a four-person commission headed by Emmanuel Omuku to determine how ready South Africa was for unity. And many people, uh, in fact, shared their views, and uh, they had uh, the commission had a hearing at Claremont Chess Club, and at that uh, Claremont Chess Club, everybody was invited to give their views. And I didn't put in some of the comments here, but uh, if you read the press, and you read Mark Levitt's magazine at the time, uh, you'll see that uh, the debates were very vigorous and robust. and. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's another chapter that we need to, to read about. But be that as it may, the Commission on South Africa proposed that South Africa be readmitted provisionally back into to FIDE uh, and also to allow a South African team to participate in the Olympiad. And it was then agreed that the following players, Dion Solomons, David Gluckman, Charles de Villiers, Lyndon Bauer, Maxwell Solomon, with Captain Mark Levitt and President Bertie van Bay could travel to, to the Philippines. So what was interesting is that the Olympiad started on June the 7th, which would be round one. We traveled on the 2nd of June because there were no visas for us to get into the Philippines because, of course, the Philippines had no relationship with South Africa. So we had to travel to Hong Kong, and Bertie and Mark and others had to then go to the embassy in Hong Kong to try to get secure visas for us to travel to the Philippines to be in time. So we spent three days in Kowloon in, uh, in Hong Kong waiting for the visas to, to come through and finally it came through and uh, in that first round we played against Argentina and uh, Dion had to play against Daniel Campora, Grandmaster and uh, um, some of you may know this very famous game of um, Gasparo versus Campora which is a 
Queen's Gambit with Kasparov Castle's queen side, uh, and of course Kampora himself was a strong grandmaster. I played on board four, and I played against the guy who would become the world junior champion, Pablo Zaniki, and I actually ended up an exchange up against him, and I just couldn't finish him off, and of course he, he defeated me, and we lost that game 4-0, but we, we certainly did not uh, disgrace ourselves. So what is very interesting is that um, I did not know at the time, because of course we were new to international chess, but I scored 50%. Uh, at the Olympiad, which qualified me for the Candid Master title. And I did not even know that uh, we could apply, because no one in South Africa knew how international chess was actually working. So only <laughs> 10 years later was I awarded the Candid Master title for my achievement in 1992. So um, I hold the record of having qualified, but not having the award bestowed upon me. And uh, the first award actually goes to uh, David Gluckman at the back because David beat Charles in the Zonal Championship in Botswana in 1993 to become South Africa's first international master. And uh, in terms of the woman, um, Caroline Bijot became the first woman international master in South Africa in 1993 as well. And um, I'm trying to still trace the, f the earlier titles as well because I I tend to think, uh, David, that uh, Mikhail Larkas may have also got his title uh, in 1993. Yeah, it was in yeah, and, and both Watu and George were set there, <laughs> I remember, in Botswana because they got two-thirds in the zone. Yes, so that's, so that's the one that we need to get. So here's an interesting picture. You'll see there, uh, there's a young David Gluckman, Lyndon Bower, Dion Solomons, always prominent with a moustache. Uh, Maxwell and uh, Charles with his Ray-Bans. Charles, Charles never let go of those Ray-Bans those years as well. <laughs> so that's uh, one in, uh, that was taken uh, in the Philippines because uh, the Philippines was also celebrating the Independence Day uh, on one of the days in June, I can't remember which one, and Corazon Aquino was the, was the president of the, of the Philippines at, at the time. So for many of us, and uh, for, for me in particular, the Olympia, overwhelming experience um, because of course it's the first time that we've actually been in the same hall with all these grandmasters and it's just something completely new and uh, what was interesting was uh, the first time elder we met Nigel Freeman was in 1992 and he took us to dinner in Hong Kong um, where we actually chatted uh, quite a lot and uh, I'm not sure what we actually ate that evening but it was the stuff was still live and uh, I also met Stuart Rubin and, um, from England, uh, who, who was a good friend. And then we also met Grandmaster Gulko, who was staying at the same hotel, Boris Gulko, same hotel as, as ourselves. Grandmaster Sivawan, uh, Gilfeld, who uh, was spelled incorrectly there, Shirov and, and others. And uh, one of the highlights for me was uh, in round seven of the Olympiad, uh, I was not playing that round, I was the reserve. But uh, I, of course, you still make your way to the hall. And round seven, was USA versus Russia. And in that particular round was Kamsky versus Kasparov. And Kasparov played black, King's Indian. And uh, Kamsky played bishop takes f4, knight on f4, uh, ef, queen takes f4. And Kasparov, after the game, said the schoolboy ever. You can never take the, the knight on f4 and give up your dark square bishop because Kasparov, of course, just annihilated him on the dark square, but for me, sitting and watching this game in action was just superb. And of course, many of you will also know that 1992 was also the debut of um, Kramnik, all of 15 years of age, scoring eight and a half out of nine. And uh, I remember uh, also watching uh, Kasparov's game against Nikolik, and against Nikolik, he actually played knight takes g7 and just opened up the king side. Um, against Pedrek Nikolic in the bosnia Herzegovina match. So it was fantastic because you had the opportunity of actually standing next to the boards. There was an enclosure, but to actually able to watch the games in action because there weren't a lot of screens at the time, so you actually had to walk uh, between there. So that's uh, uh, um, the interesting note, of course, is that Charles was part of the last Olympia team in 74, and of course, 18 years later, he was part of the first team to be readmitted. So it's a unique record that Charles' longevity was able to, to continue as well. Yeah, no, we're going to come to that now. But of course, um, that Olympia team was not without criticism. There were certain people within the chess community that questioned why Lyndon Bower and Maxwell Solomon were in the team. 
because they did not believe that we were strong enough to be in the team. And uh, however, the parties that were debating unity and negotiations at the time felt that the principles of unity and representativity was more important at that time than to have a full strength, shall we say, all the Lee White team. And it, it was a big discussion point. And uh, to this day, I still have the newspaper cuttings of the people who actually criticized the team. And I decided not to put them in here because one or two of them are still active. But the, the key point for, for me is that uh, it, it, it was a sore point because, of course, uh, we felt at the time that they did not understand that you would not have been able to play international chess if we did not have unity in the country. So therefore, the first team to go outside of the country had to show a unified face. And we got to the first, we got to the Philippines and in round one, Dion, David, Charles, all of us, we asked the arbiter to take away the South African flag. Because at that stage, they had the South African flag, the old flag, <laughs> next to our board. And we asked them politely to remove that because we couldn't play under that flag. So those players, we, we had the critics. So we have to talk about that because it wasn't all plain sailing. And, and that was the, the things that was written about in, in South Africa. And of course, it didn't help that in the 1993 SA close that was held in Cape Town, Maxwell and I came last. So we had 12 players playing the SA close. We played at Claremont. And uh, uh, the team had to go to Egypt. I think it was all African uh, team championships. And Maxwell and I came last. And uh, that didn't help our cause at all. And just, just added, you know, just fuel there to the doubting Thomases and, and, uh, and so forth. So, so that was a, a tough period because we were trying still to unify South African chess uh, to, to, its, to its great heights. But uh, that's, that's part of history. But one of the nice things was that in 1994, everybody had, all the organizations, SACON, CAPSA, and the Federation had agreed that the 1994 team would be chosen from a trials. And that trials took place at Pentec again in September 1994. And 14 players were invited from across the country. Um, I'm not sure what if, if the guy that you spoke about uh, uh, was, was there, but there was a gentleman called uh, Ishmael de Landlin, not Lendley, that came from Soweto. Yeah, he, he came. Yeah, that's someone else. So, so he came, Kromot came, and uh, Watu played for the first time uh, there as well with us. So 14 players, Pentec, and yeah, we had to fight it out. And I was very pleased with my performance, six wins, six draws, and one loss to Charles. And uh, I qualified for the team on merit. And Maxwell also did the same by coming in fifth position because the top five qualified. So that, uh, I think, in my view, the, the critics were silent, albeit two years later, we had actually made the Olympiad team on merit, if, uh, if, if you want. And we had played for our position. So it, it is a, it's a very tenuous situation because 1992, unity, representation, transformation, quota players, that whole debate we can still have a, a long uh, evening about. But uh, that was the, the one. I had a very bad Olympiad in 1994, something like two and a half out of nine. Very, very bad uh, end of my, my law exams. And I had felt I'd let the team down. But I actually felt even worse for Charles because Charles missed an outright master, uh, international master title because one of his opponents didn't pitch up. Venezuela didn't pitch up. And if Charles, had, if that guy had just pitched up, Charles de Valier today would have had his international master title because at the Olympiad, you can get these titles directly based on your percentage and, and performance. So that was a bad one. And uh, uh, Watu started badly in 94 with a half out of six and then had a remarkable uh, uh, performance with five and a half out of six. Something must have happened there in the middle, but, uh, but Watu, that, that, uh, Watu turned his fortunes around. And there's a, a photo of a young Watu and Dion and Maxwell and Lyndon uh, on the Red Square. Uh, that's behind us in Basil's Cathedral, Moscow 94. And then, uh, okay, we can't see Charles and, and Watu now. That's fine, we'll move on. So one of the other interesting things that uh, I just want to, to point out is that um, chess was the second South African sport to play internationally. It's a little known fact. Many people always talk about all the other glamour, but let's just, for us chess players, talk about this for a moment. The first South African team to play internationally, March 1992, Cricket World Cup in Australia, and South Africa bows out in the semi-finals, having to score 
22 runs of one ball because of the uh, Duckworth Lewis system. And of course, South Africa doesn't win, uh, can't do it. And Pakistan wins great for Imran Khan and, and others. However, South African chess was in the next sporting code to go play internationally because we played June the 7th to June 25 in the Philippines. And one week later, 3rd, 4th July, the Olympic Games began in Barcelona and Nelson Mandela and others led the South African team. And all of you are familiar with the photo of Ilana Meyer and, and um, Elavato Tulu uh, coming first and second in the 10,000 meter running with the South African and the Ethiopian flag. But the key thing for us uh, really is that as chess players, we've got to celebrate the fact that we were the second code out of the blocks when it came to 1992 with the establishment. So Mr. Smart, the president of Chess South Africa, one of the things that has not happened is that the 1992 and 1994 teams have still not been awarded Blazers because in those years, we could only get the money together for the flights. But those pioneers, I believe, should still actually receive their Blazers uh, for 1992 and 1994. And maybe, um, just to remind all of you, this is the 25th year of readmission, 1992, 25 years readmission, and next year will be the 60th year of Olympic participation, because Mr. Leonard Wittstein led that first South African team, 1958, to Munich, to that Olympiad, and then after that, he also led the team in 64 to Tel Aviv and 66 to Cuba, uh, with, with Eddie Price, who um, was one of the highest scoring South Africans uh, at the Olympiad. The, in conclusion, uh, my last page is that the Unity Tournament, when I made a few phone calls to about three or four people on Sunday when I was preparing for this lecture, when, when David had asked me to come say a few words, I phoned just a few people to get their views, and I received four different views about the same period. So it's going to be very interesting one day, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Dion, when we actually convene that discussion, because everybody has a different interpretation. Omar and I are still debating when unity actually took place. Was it 91? Was it 92? Was it 95? Or was it 96? When the actual document got signed. It's very interesting, because I said to him, I if you say unity wasn't there in 95, Dion had played two Olympiads already by that time. We had played three unified leagues already by that time. But it was very interesting because Omar's experience is that the first unified schools was only 1995 at Belleville, at, Son, uh, uh, at, at Bok, at the college on that side. So were we unified at senior level and not at junior level? These are, are real questions that, that we don't have the answers to, to just yet. Um, one of the interesting things is when we came to play the unity tournament, we actually even brought Dr. Lloyd Hill from Stellenbosch with us in the combi. And uh, as well as an, another gentleman called Gideon, they traveled with us. Dr. Ieso has, has promised me that he's going to work on a lecture on, on schools. And what is interesting for me is that that first tournament, 1995 in Belleville, was the first time our Grandmaster Kenny Solomon actually won a national championship. He won the under-16 championship in, uh, in 1995 and traveled to Brazil thereafter. Now, Kenny and I also share a little history because in 1993, I, it was my last uh, junior year, and I was playing um, to go to the African Junior Championships, and Reggie Sinden insisted that a young player that no one had heard of, Kenny Solomon, be put in the trials directly without having played any qualifying. And at that stage, the Western Province organizers did not want that. And uh, after many to and throwing, Reggie Sinden was insisting, very insistent, they allowed Kenny to play. And to the surprise of all, I came first, Kenny came second. And Kenny and I then qualified to go to Johannesburg to play in the South African trials to, to play. Kenny and I traveled by bus uh, to, together to Johannesburg. And uh, we stayed with my uncle in Rivoli in uh, Johannesburg. And so here's a very interesting story that takes place now here yeah, because we arrived two days before the tournament uh, to climatize and, and the like. And then my uncle took us to Highgate in Johannesburg. Now, I mean, all of you know how big Johannesburg is. And who should we bump into? Dr. Shabir Bawadin. <laughs> we bumped into Shabir in Johannesburg completely fortuitously. And Shabir spent the better part of the evening at my uncle 
playing chess. And in fact, uh, the other day I found a photo where Shabir, myself, and Kitty are playing chess uh, at my uncle's place. So Shabir, I didn't know how you got it right to the finest, but uh, we enjoyed that evening. Uh, Kenny, Kenny, in fact, did not make the cut to go to the African Junior Championship because uh, he lost out and uh, Anthony Levy and I actually qualified to go to the African Junior and um, there were guys, Keith Cornell and others that were all playing in the tournament as well that was at that stage stronger than, than Kenny of course. Um, in December that year, uh, African Junior, that's when I came second and one of the things I often tell the juniors nowadays, everybody, whether you are 12 under, it is now an FM. Now, those days they didn't even give titles and we would have been FIDE Masters and other title holders, but at that stage those, torn, those titles were actually not, not being awarded. Of course, the, there's many tales to tell because there's many debates that we still have to have because the jury is still on, is still out there whether or not unity was good, whether in all sporting codes, not only about chess, and whether or not we should have unified in 91 or 92 or, or later. That debate is still out there. For me, uh, having lived through that particular period, um, I, I would still uh, probably at this stage support the views of, of Bertie van Wyk at that stage who was adhering to the call of the ANC to actually speak to, the, to our counterparts because if we didn't do that we would have probably been, uh, not have played international chess at that stage and we probably would have not had the development where, where we are. So, colleagues, thank you very much. I'm available for some questions, and uh, that's the last uh, picture of the 1992 team. Thank you very much. Well, thank you tonight, I hope you had a, a wonderful evening with us. I could see that you were very entertained, especially by our, our speakers and the stories they had to tell. This is not the end of it, I hope. This is our TRC that happened maybe 25 years ago. <laughs> um, the, f the, the, the amazing thing is that I think we have our politicians, right? But when you listen to the chess players, and these are three top chess players that spoke tonight, one feels more, I think. One is more in tune with what really happened because the player says it as it was or as it is. There are other players as well. We have Mark Rubri here that hasn't spoken. I'm not sure if he ever wants to say something because he's got an encyclopedia there that you could divulge into and, and tell us all about the history of South African chess. Um, there's a Mr. Van Rienen, um, also now semi-retired as an administrator and he's keen to, to, to tell his story about the history of Saka and Capsa. So uh, maybe this is not the end of it, um, Dr. Bower. Thank you for, for DCAS for coming to the party and, and sponsoring this, this um, Heritage Festival as well as the evening. Um, thank you to Cape Town Chess Club for a wonderful um, evening and for a fantastic venue and, and for the snacks. I think this will go down in history as an event of note, as an occasion that we will all remember. So thank you for all the participants, for everybody that came. I think 25 people is quite quite nice for, for an occasion like this. And from Chess Western Province, go well, drive safely. Thank you.